Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to shout really loudly, so maybe take off your headphones or something. <laughs> okay. Three, two, <laughs> one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're done. So, uh, oh, cool. Please, please add oh, that man. as our preface. <laughs> <laughs> as the intro, do that as the intro. Yeah. I'll, like, <laughs> I'll like auto tune it and change the notes. Be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then have the music play after that. That'd be fantastic. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, I'll see what I. I'll see what I do. Oh no. <laughs> Welcome to the Interstate Gamers Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, a.k.a. K-Slugs. My name is Peter, a.k.a. Deal For Real, and I'm also your host. And my name is Ryan, a.k.a. Rye Bread, and uh, I'm a guest on the show today. Was I not supposed to come in? Kevin, who, who is this guy? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. He kind of, I, you know, I saw him in college one time, uh, my freshman year, and he's kind of followed me around ever since. Uh... And so I opened my door the other day, and this, this is a Friday night, and all of a sudden this dude is at my door, and he's like, Kevin, long time no see. I'm so glad to spend time with you this weekend. I'm like, what? And so apparently, you know, yeah, it's uh, one of my... Uh, it's the truth. <laughs> randos from College Station. It is the truth. Right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll do the honors then. I'll say that Ryan is a good friend of ours, especially a good friend of Kevin's. They did go to college together. Ryan is, uh, I would say, passionate about video games, especially some in particular. And uh, mm-hmm. we wanted to bring him onto the show because he's got a lot of good things to say. So, Ryan, welcome to Interstate Gamers. You're our first ever guest. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, I am re- very honored to be on here today uh, to be your first guest on the show. That's quite a bit. That's quite a lot to, uh, uh, to live up to. So I'm going to do my best to give you uh, the points of why I like uh, some video games the way I, I do, and uh, hopefully I will add a lot of good things to the conversation today, maybe so much so that you might invite me back in the future. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I mean... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll be the judge. <laughs> We're only like two minutes in. <laughs> yeah, rando guy. So um, anyway, as you guys know, on this podcast, we rate and discuss some of our favorite video games. But if you didn't know that, well, that's what we do. And uh, the goal here is to kind of spark conversations and fun discussions about some of these games and uh, perhaps even get a little bit critical about them. So, uh, yeah, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, Today we've got a game that is very special to at least me. Um, Kevin, I believe you might have played this game for the first time recently or maybe for (laughs) the first time in a long time. I'm not so sure. And uh, Ryan, this game is is part of a franchise that I know that you're very fond of. And this game that we're going to discuss today is Metroid Zero Mission. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I did, <laughs> in fact, just complete uh, my first full run through of Zero Mission. Can't confirm. Witnessed it in person. <laughs> yeah. Chris and I were discussing the other day um, how we think... Because Chris and I went to the same daycare when we were uh, little. My my friend Chris, or some of you might know him online as Z-Link. But uh, we went to the same daycare. Yeah, it's cute. I know, whatever, daycare. But we exchanged games a lot of times, and uh, we played each other's video games and stuff like that. And uh, I think I played a little bit of his Zero Mission game, and I've played various parts of it beforehand. So I was familiar with, like some parts here and there but like for the entire game i was like at a complete loss but yes i did complete it for the first time um today and i have played uh metroid fusion which is the only other metroid game that i have beaten and so um this being another game boy advance metroid game uh you know i was very excited to give it a try and uh talk about it on this podcast so very cool uh ryan how about you yeah, so uh, Metroid Zero Mission actually for me is the second uh, Metro game I have ever beaten and owned. Uh, so I didn't, uh, I was kind of late to playing Nintendo games. My first console I owned was the GameCube uh, all the way back in 2006. 
is when I finally got the GameCube. Uh, and the reason why I wanted it is because uh, a good friend of mine named Brandoff, he introduced uh, Metroid Prime to me and I loved it. Uh, so I got the GameCube for that game in particular. And I owned a Game Boy Advance and SP actually. And I decided to try out the next game in the series, which was uh, Zero Mission was right there. And so uh, Metroid Zero Mission was my first 2D Metroid game. And so that's kind of the history with me with that game. And I have played it and beaten it throughout the years roughly eight times. And so I definitely know my fair share of Metroid Zero Mission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds like you do. Um, this game, I believe Metroid Zero Mission might be the first Metroid game that I ever properly owned as my own game because when I was younger my older brother had the Super Nintendo and he had Super Metroid so although I grew up playing a lot of Super Metroid it was never really mine and so Metroid Zero Mission was the first Metroid game that was you know mine and uh, I have played it I've beaten it many times Um, I actually played it earlier today I started a new file and I got pretty much three quarters of the way through the game maybe a little more in about an hour and a half to two hours Ooh, which nice. uh, that, that that time frame I think is something we'll probably talk about at one point because mm-hmm. um, you know length of games is always a consideration. But uh, yeah, I love this game. I think there's a lot of good things about it. I do want to say before I forget, uh, just to establish the usual little context that I do, that this game came out in February of 2004, whereas I believe the Game Boy Advance was released in 2001. But uh, yeah, somewhat of a uh, of a late Game Boy Advance game, all things considered. And uh, as you mentioned, Kevin, it's the second Metroid game for the Game Boy Advance coming after Metroid Fusion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, So before we get into it, how about we talk about the brewskis we're uh, brewing on? You know, I was uh, was about to ask. I wasn't sure if we would be doing that today, but I do have a brew in hand ready to discuss. Um, I guess I can go first then. That's cool. Yeah. So today I'm actually drinking one of my favorite beers, uh, this is the first time on the show that I think I've drank a beer that I know that I like a lot. And it is from the same brewing company as last time. It's from Great Divide Brewing Company here in Denver. And it is the Colette Farmhouse Ale. It's a very delicious beer. It's very, maybe not very sweet, but it is quite sweet. Um, it's about 7% ABV. It's... Um, it's a very hazy, golden color beer. It's very pleasant to look at, so much so that I actually poured it out of the can for once on the podcast. <laughs> Got it sitting in a nice glass over here. Um, but I'm a huge fan of it. It's it's uh, one of my go-tos. Man, that sounds delicious. Um, so for us, this is, this is kind of interesting. So Ryan, he was like, I got to get a beer for the podcast. You know, I was like, well, yeah, you definitely do. And uh, I didn't have a... Well, I normally have my sh- <laughs> my Shiner, so I have my it Shiner. Still does. Yeah, it's, it's in the fridge right it's now. It's still in the fridge, <laughs> but I was like, you know what, Ryan, uh, you pick me up a beer uh, while you're at the store, too. So he goes and he comes back, and he brings me back one of his favorite beers, and uh, it's called the Fat Tire. Um, and I'll let him go into a little bit of discussion of what about what Fat Tire is to Ryan. But, um, yeah, I just basically, Ryan got me a beer. It's called Fat Tire, and it's an amber, so I love it. <laughs> Yeah, so this actually hits close to home for you, Peter. As you know, uh, Fat Tire is uh, the main ale from New Belgium, is what they're really famous for. Uh, So Fat Tire has always been my favorite go-to beer. And so uh, it might not be like, you know, the nicest beer in all, but it's just very solid for a great choice that I like to go to for any party, any social gathering, all that stuff. Uh, So Fat Tire, I I get it from my dad. Uh, I get a lot of things from my dad, and taste and beer is one of them. And so uh, I actually been to the uh, the uh, what's it called? <laughs> Blah, I'm blanking right now. Brewery. Yeah, so I've been to the brewery in uh, Fort Collins. <laughs> so I don't know why. I, I, was, I was trying to come up with the name New Belgium, but I forgot it for a split second. I don't know why. But I've been to the New Belgium beer brewery in uh, Fort Collins. Uh, so I don't know if you ever been, but it's really good, fantastic. Uh, and yeah, that's what we're having today. You know what? Uh, this is a this might be a spoiler for you two, not for listeners, because by the time this episode comes out, this will already have happened. But on the Yeasty Boys podcast, on which I was a guest today, by the way, um, for those who might not know, we actually drank and reviewed the Fat Tire because um, <laughs> at the very last, I didn't know I was going to be on the show until I woke up this morning and I was like, oh shit, you know, gotta get ready. <laughs> and uh, at the last minute, we tried to 
um, choose a beer that we could all drink, you know, for the sake of all having the same beer. And they asked me, hey, Peter, what are some breweries that you like that might be out here in Kentucky? And I said, oh, there's uh, Avery, there's uh, Great Divide, there's uh, New Belgium. And they were like, oh, yeah, we have some fat tires lying around. And I said, great, I can go to the liquor store that's like a two-minute <laughs> drive away from me and grab some, uh, crazy. some fat tire. <laughs> uh, fun fact, I had actually never had one before today, believe it or not. Wow. And you lived in Colorado <laughs> for basically your whole life? And that's definitely mm. not true. <laughs> He's lived there oh, for a man. couple of years. Oh, that's true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at so least, at least since you've been 21, you've been in Colorado for the most that's part. That's also not true, but oh, much closer it. than the last thing you said. Okay. <laughs> I've been in Colorado for a, a year and a half. But uh, yeah, anyway, so I had my first ever, not, not to hijack your, uh, your fat tire uh, description. I just thought it was a funny coincidence. Wanted to point that gotcha. out. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, moving on to our games, uh, yeah, our game. Um, but yeah, finally, no, yeah, finally the game segment. Um, so yeah, Metroid Zero Mission. Uh, I believe we're starting off with gameplay. So uh, who wants to take it away from here? Why don't we have uh, the guest Ryan? Oh shoot! Oh no! <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Before uh, I guess I could start with some of the points that uh, about Metroid Zero Mission. Uh, first off, uh, every time I think or play this game, uh, I think of my brother Jason, my younger brother Jason. Uh, this is actually his favorite video game of all time. Uh, mm. And when he was really young, when I got uh, Metroid Zero Mission, uh, I uh, introduced this game to him. And this was one of the first video games he's ever played. And so because of that, he's loved this game ever since. So he's actually not even a Metroid fan for the most part. He only played like, he'd beaten like two games in the series. But to this day, this is his favorite video game of all time. So I want to give shout outs to Jason in that. And I do love this game. Uh, so I guess the first thing that I really like about Zero Mission is the controls. Uh, to me, they're very crisp. It's a very fast paced game. Uh, Samus feels really good to move around uh, in the environments. And uh, it's actually my favorite uh, physics engine for any 2D Metroid. So that includes, uh, obviously, Super Metroid, uh, Metroid Fusion, and even Samus Returns. It's just my favorite physics engine. Uh, I just love just the fast-pacedness of the game and how crisp, how crisp and easy the controls are. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually one of uh, my favorite things about the game as well. I think I might have said once or twice on the podcast that I tend to favor uh, heavier gravity in video games. Or I guess a better way to say it was I'm not so much of a fan of uh, floaty games. And Super Super Metroid, although it's an amazing game, it is very floaty. So for me, when I'm playing Zero Mission, I feel that crispness and I feel that uh, that weight to Samus that really like visually matches with her power suit a little more, maybe. Like, you know, she's wearing all this armor you'd think yeah. maybe she would be <laughs> pretty heavy. And when I'm playing this game, I do feel that sense of weight and that sense of uh, the sense of speed, too, which kind of contradicts the weight, but it makes sense when you're playing the game that she feels so responsive and so uh, I keep saying crisp and I maybe I should look into the thesaurus, but it's just such a great word to describe the, <laughs> the movement in this game. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think the mechanics felt really smooth and polished uh, for primarily the most part. I did notice a little bit of lag when I would do the uh, speed boost uh, power. Um, but other than that, no, it's very smooth game and especially for the Game Boy Advance um, it felt natural for that console for that handheld gaming device so um, yeah definitely agree on that note one thing I do want to talk about is uh, some of the button controls rather than the physics and I'm, I'm going to be comparing a lot of things to Super Metroid because that's kind of my big other uh, Metroid game I've played a lot mm -hmm. and this thing is one of them where one button feature that I really enjoyed was that in order to arm your missiles, all you have to do is hold the R button, and for as long as you're holding it, you'll shoot the missiles. So rather than toggling between, like, shoot missile mode or not shoot missile mode, you just hold the R button, and it's as simple as that. And Super Metroid, what you had to do was you had to cycle through all of your items, not just, like, missile and beam, in order to get to the weapon you wanted to use. So say you had, like, the power bomb selected, and let's say that the missile is maybe three slots away. You have to press select or X or Y or whatever button it was uh, repeatedly to get to that weapon. And here in this game, they've really streamlined it to where 
if you're running around normally, you hold R, you arm your missile. If you're in a ball, you hold R and you, you arm your power bomb, and it's just a really uh, intuitive way to handle that sort of thing, which I think is a big improvement over previous games, especially Super Metroid. Oh yeah, I agree. And actually, that was uh, first introduced the uh, R button missile mechanic uh, in Fusion, and so Fusion was actually the first game that they uh, introduced that. And I'm glad they kept it over uh, when they uh, did Zero Mission, and so it's something that I really like in uh, 2D Metroid especially, and they actually still kept it that way uh, when they did Samus Returns for the 3DS, and so I'm glad that that still holds up to this day. Solid choice. So I have a question, um, because I'm I'm not really sure on this, but where is this game in terms of, like, is it the last 2D platformer Metroid game before Samus Returns? It is, yeah. So that's, uh, that's why Samus Returns was such a big deal. For a lot of us Metroid fans, uh, was because uh, you know Zero Mission was the last 2D Metroid, and that was you know 2004. And so before Samus Returns came out, you know this past year in 2017, uh, it was it's been a 13 year gap, uh, and so and they're still we're still kind of waiting for a totally new original 2D Metroid because <laughs> the last one is still Fusion, <laughs> uh, in, back in 2002. But yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and uh, while while we're on the topic, one thing I wanted to mention real quick is that, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is that Metroid Zero Mission is a retelling of the original Metroid game. So uh, a lot, so the areas are the same, the characters and the plot are mostly the same. Um, it's a kind of a reboot, I guess would be one word for it. So it's not even an entirely new uh, storyline, which is which goes back to your point, Ryan, of saying that Fredroid. Uh, sorry, Metroid Fusion, <laughs> aka Metroid Fusion, <laughs> oh, was boy. the last, you know, original proper 2D Metroid. Game. Metroid Fusion. Metroid Fusion. <laughs> I love it. One thing I wasn't like, uh, I, I had a little bit of trouble with uh, in terms of mechanics, and I think Ryan probably knows what I'm about to mention. <laughs> Here we go. This is this is so funny, Peter. You're the power this. grip feature. I struggle with that so hard because I guess it just didn't feel natural to me it's or whatever. So funny. But I finally, towards the end of the game, figured out the best way for me to accomplish it personally. I guess I expected it to when you grabbed the ledge for it to if you just held left or right for you to just go up on the ledge, or if you push down, you just fall. Well, that's not exactly how it works. You either have to hold up and left or right, or you press left, and, and this is the one I did later on because I finally figured out, left or right and press A. And so that's the method I ended up doing it with. But beforehand, I would try to get up from the ledge. And here I am waving around my arm, just on the ledge, just trying to get up the ledge. And Chris and Ryan so are just funny. laughing at me. Um but yeah, I was like, I, it doesn't feel smooth or natural to me in that. But that's really picky. That's getting really nitpicky. But um, I just thought it was one funny thing I should mention. Yeah, no, that's a... I, I was prepared to laugh at you for like being dumb or something. That's actually totally valid. Especially uh, especially considering that we all play a lot of Melee. And in Melee, to get up from the ledge, all you have to do at a bare minimum is just press forward right yeah in this yeah. game i guess it's not so simple <laughs> it's a little bit more yeah i also feel like holding something especially when you know freaking mother brain you know that boss when that le ledge has become pretty important in that uh fight particularly and really in a lot of scenarios in metroid where you know you get knocked off a ledge and you're hanging there and you need to get up really quickly uh, it's kind of annoying if you if the only way you know about is to hold up and right you'd have to wait like at least a second for it to go up there. Whereas if you hold left and right and press A, you get up there a little bit quicker. So um, I was glad I was able to finally figure out a faster method. Um, but I, I feel as though it should probably be easier to get up there. But that that's segueing into another thing about uh, gameplay. Uh, Mother Brain was awful, in my opinion. <laughs> Just straight up awful. That was not not my favorite boss. I will say. He did struggle a little bit. Uh, can you elaborate? Well, it's just so... It didn't seem like that was the boss itself. It was more along the lines... And I guess Mother Brain might be controlling the security system. 
But it felt like I was fighting the security system more than Mother Brain. And it kind of took me out of the fight with Mother Brain and just trying to escape these things that are constantly hitting me because I need to stand in one spot and shoot Mother Brain. Um, so there was a lot of bosses like that, actually. It's not as so like Fusion, there was a lot of, and I go back to Fusion, I use it as my frame of reference for Metroid games. Because it is like my one Metroid game that I know and have loved before this one. Um, but I, I did a lot of references to it. And, you know, in that game, there's a lot of moving around when it comes to other bosses. Um, there's a lot of mobility where you can like run around and kind of use the entire area that you're in to fight these bosses. And I know this is a remake of the old one, but um, yeah, it's not so much the case in. Uh, zero mission whereas you're kind of trapped into the corner like on most bosses and you you're really limited to movement um so it it wasn't my favorite because i kind of like to be moving around more than just stationary and and the fact that there's just so many things shooting you is just aggravating more than it was challenging um so i guess that that was my critique of the mother brain boss and kind of the bosses of uh, zero mission in general you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because I think that, well, first of all, I do want to say that um, in defense of the mother brain uh, security system aspect, uh, the cool thing I think in this game is that she's not the final boss of the game. So maybe it's like more defensible from that standpoint that maybe her fight's a little like anticlimactic. Whereas in Super Metroid, for example, she is the final boss, but you don't just have a security system. She has this crazy second form that's a lot more crazy, I guess would be one word to describe it. Uh, But another thing in this game is that you got me thinking about the different boss fights and the mini boss fights even in this game. Yeah. And I realized that I think that the mini boss fights, several of them involve you moving around a lot more than the main boss fights. Uh, For example, in the, in the crate area, the, the mini boss is like a little claw that comes out of some acid (laughs) and tries to, well, claw you. And you have this little, uh, what's the word, like a, a zip line type of thing that you can traverse the area with. And uh, in the Ridley area, there's this mini boss that's basically a giant bee type insect that flies all the way across the screen left and right in this pretty wide room. And you have to, well, you don't have to, but you can run around to avoid it if you want. And uh, those both those instances give you a lot more mobility and flexibility than any of the main bosses do. So I think that's actually a really interesting point that you bring up. And to tag in actually the mother brain aspect, um, I think that's actually more to be more true to the original because uh, this is a remake. In the original Metroid, uh, Metroid, uh, not blah, mother brain is the final boss, and uh, mother brain actually does not fight back at all. All you have to do in the original Metroid is uh, destroy the glass container and shoot mother brain, and the only thing stopping you is the Rinkas and the turrets that are shooting at you the entire time. Uh, So that's it in the original Metroid for the final boss. Uh, And so in this game, what I do like, though, is that they kind of stayed true to that and made that just as chaotic. Uh, But uh, Mother Brain actually fires a laser out of her eye at you. And so uh, and she closes her eye when you fall down. And so it makes it a little hard to hit her eye to, you know, so she protects herself a little bit more. And you have to wait to dodge her laser and then damage her afterwards. So it's actually uh, much more interaction in this game than it is in the original Metroid. So that's something that I actually enjoy the Mother Brain boss in this game. Yeah, um, I, I did think that was one thing that they probably were trying to... They felt really constrained by was the other game and the fact that this was a, a remake and so I did take that kind of into consideration. And, and they probably expanded on the boss in itself. Um, I'm just kind of thinking from a purely, like, not knowing that. Uh, well, I guess not even that, but I felt as though, I I don't know, I'm coming from Fusion where a lot of the bosses, e- even some of the mini bosses, there's just a lot more moving around and fighting them. And it feels a lot more intuitive than just backed into a corner. Um, I felt like they could have done it. Well, you know, you showed me Ridley from the original Super Metroid, and he is a lot less... Uh, He's a lot smaller than he is in this game. <laughs> Ryan, isn't he? Yes. Uh, well, their sizes are comparable. Um, 
So there, it's not too much different. And the Ridley fight, you actually should be moving around in that boss fight if you want to do it well. Uh, if not, uh, you'll just get grabbed and you'll just spit fire at your face. <laughs> but Kevin, that was something that you actually did pretty good at earlier today. Uh, you actually didn't get grabbed once. And so I'm actually really <laughs> impressed. Because when I first played Zero Mission, I definitely got grabbed a uh, ton of times. And so you actually did that pretty well. I'm, I was very impressed. Shout outs to Smash Bros. <laughs> yeah, don't get grabbed. Don't get hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Moving on to a uh, a better note about the game, I really enjoyed how fast paced and intense the uh, the game was, and how it kind of got my heart rate going, especially the uh, Zero Suit Samus portion. Uh-huh. Um, that that part really got my heart racing, and uh, it was really exciting and intense to just kind of kind of react to like, oh my gosh, there's a <laughs> there's a space pirate. <laughs> shoot him and then run so I thought that was pretty fun I'm, I'm glad they included that in the game it did feel a little bit long uh, as I thought the game was going to end <laughs> but I, <laughs> that's true I, I, I guess I was okay with it <laughs> yeah um, I, I could talk about the ending for a long time and once we get to the content section I think I will because I think a lot I think a lot of uh, what makes the ending so special is more in like the, the content category Okay, mm-hmm. but um, I do want to expand kind of on what you're saying where uh, the the space pirate section at the end. I guess I'll explain a little bit for people who might not know. In the original Metroid, once you defeat Mother Brain, um, she activates a self-destruct timer on the entire planet, I believe, and you evacuate. In this game, it's a little different, where you she does the same thing, but she doesn't blow up the whole planet. She just blows up the immediate area, and you escape in your ship, but then the space pirates shoot you down. And so you are stripped of your power armor. You become... a uh, what is now probably like the famous or infamous Zero Suit Samus. And you have to basically Metal Gear Solid your way through the entire uh, <laughs> mothership of the Space Pirates, and then you enter like the Chozo Ruins, which is called Chozodia. And you basically uh, do like a ritual sort of thing. You get your power suit back, and then you uh, you defeat Meta Ridley, and then you escape for the final time, and then you blow up the mothership. And so, so what they did basically was just add a whole new expanded ending. Um... But what I wanted to say is that I think that the... Hmm, I really appreciate the new mechanics that they added to that section of the game. Uh, you have a little stun pistol instead of, you know, beams that are capable of destroying things. And you have to pretty much entirely change the way you play the game. Because up until that point, you're mainly running through wreaking havoc, shooting bitches left and right, not really having <laughs> a care in the world. But you feel really vulnerable when you're Zero Suit Samus against these space pirates who are actually, like, terrifying in many ways. Um, and I and I could talk about their AI and their attack patterns and stuff, but I I will either <laughs> say that or I just won't it's mention pretty it. Funny. But uh, but yeah, like they add a lot of new stuff. They add a whole stealth aspect, um, and then once you do get your power suit back, it just makes you feel so powerful and triumphant. And uh, as far as content goes, that's great, and we can talk more about that later. But as far as gameplay, like the literal mechanics they introduce, I just think they do a stellar job. Right. I I agree in general. And to touch on that, Peter, uh, actually, the original Metroid, uh, uh, Zebes does not entirely blow up. It's just that area, just like in Zero Mission. Oh, okay. So that would be kind of awkward because in Super Metroid, you return to Zebes. Yeah, and I then, had a brain fart there. <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. And then uh, actually, Zebes does get destroyed entirely at the end of uh, Metroid Fusion. Fusion. So rip Zebes at the end of Fusion, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, doesn't it get destroyed also at the end of Zero Mission? Like you are uh, at the end of Super Metroid? Like don't you literally mm-hmm. see the planet blow up? No, it's just that section. It finally finally goes away at the end of uh Fusion when she crashes the giant BSL station to it. So, uh finally rip Zeb- Zebus and Fusion, but yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll take your word for it. I I my my instinct is that they destroyed the planet and brought it back by retconning, but I'll take your word for it because <laughs> nice. I know that you're more knowledgeable <laughs> about the franchise than I am. Yeah. Zebs is destroyed at the end of Super Metroid. The planet destroyed at the end of Metroid Fusion is SR388. Okay, well, cool. Um, I think that about does it for our gameplay, does it not? Um, I have a I couple have of some more points. Oh, okay, to... yeah, go ahead, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to stop y'all early. Uh, Ryan, I'll let you take the reins. Okay, sweet. So I, I guess for me, uh, that I really enjoyed about Zero Mission is that I loved discovering new areas and discovering new things. Uh, the game really wants you to experiment on a lot of things, and it doesn't like 
straight up tell you uh, to use certain abilities certain ways. And so I just really like discovering and trying out new things. Uh, I also really like the puzzles and the problem solving in the game. Uh, kind of an example of this is in the Norfair section, there's this uh, worm boss right after you get the wave beam. Oh, yes. And the second one, it's in that tunnel area. And what you're supposed to do is that after it charges at you, you're supposed to keep shooting it to back it up. But it's underbelly is underneath, so you can't you can't do anything. You can't shoot it. You can't damage it. Uh, and so you what you have to do, though, is you have to go into Morth Ball before it charges you, lay a bomb, and that delay, since it's charging at you, the bomb will explode at its vulnerable area underneath, and that's how you kill it. And so a lot of that uh, puzzles and problem solving is something that I really appreciate about the game. I do not want to admit how long that boss oh, no. uh, trapped me because I couldn't <laughs> I figure to. out what to do. Like when I, when I was a kid, when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I had to nudge Kevin a little bit, like nudge, nudge, wink, wink on how to uh, kill it. After it charged, he definitely just hit in the corner and just was <laughs> like, I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was like, yeah, I don't well, know what to do. And so I had to be like, nudge, nudge, Kevin, hit it underneath. Come on, you know. <laughs> it's actually a it's a pretty big uh it's a pretty big curveball because up until that point, I don't think you ever really have to use bombs offensively. Like the only time you really ever do that is if you're literally in like a one Samus wide uh morph ball corridor and there's an enemy in there and you have to bomb them. Because otherwise, like you're always using your beam or your yep. missiles, right? So like That's it's, it's yeah. the first time really like you have to use the bomb to destroy a boss. So it uh, certainly tripped me up for a long time the first time that I did it. So uh, no judgment, definitely. Um, no, none, none taken. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I don't blame you for getting stuck at that part. Well, not to you. I mean, <laughs> to Kevin. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a really creative way to use that weapon and to make you think for that mini boss. One thing I uh, well, I have. Hmm, I don't know if I can segue uh, cleverly into this. Um, Ryan, you talked about the the satisfaction you got from exploring. And uh, trying new things and ex- like using all the tools available to you to achieve different results, and I that drives really well with one of the things I enjoyed most about the game, which was how challenging it can be to get individual items like mission, mm-hmm. uh, oh, missile yes. expansions. Um, because half the fun of the game is just exploring the area as it is and like progressing forward in the area and in the story and all that. But then the other half of the game is like finding every single little item and some of them are hidden very very elaborately like especially mm-hmm. the ones that involve the speed boost um some of those are like mind bending until you you know piece it together and i really appreciate the fact that they realized how much fun that could be and made and, and not not too many of the items require that much effort there are some that do but many of them are a lot easier which is a nice balance but they just realized that one thing and they they honed it really well and just made some of the items like a real, a real pleasure, like a challenging pleasure to, <laughs> to get all of the items. Um, so that's just something I wanted to kind of touch on before I forgot. Yeah. So quick question, uh, Peter, did you actually uh, ever hundred percented Metroid Zero Mission before? Yes, I have twice, I believe, a long time ago, but I've done it. All right, sweet. <laughs> yeah, I did too, and that's actually really impressive because uh, I actually found that this is actually one of the hardest games, in my opinion, to hundred percent. Oh, wow. Uh, just because of the difficulty of some of the items you have to get. Uh, like that energy tank uh, before the robot Ridley boss uh, in the end, in the, in the mothership, that's pretty difficult. And you actually really have to go out of your way, too, to get a lot of those items. And so uh, it's, it's not an easy game to 100%. Wait, so. wait, 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 wait. You're saying, you're telling me that this game, to you, to you personally, Ryan Everett, that this is a harder game to 100% than F Zero GX. No, <laughs> definitely <laughs> okay, not. Nowhere okay, close. I was, no, I was about to say. no, no. It's just compared to other Metro games, it's a little hard to 100% this oh, one. Oh, okay. Uh, like Metro Prime, for example. Metro Prime is a uh, is a lot more convenient and easier to 100% than this game is. So, I would like to think that. Because I played this game around the time of its release, which is before I really used the internet, I'd like to think that I managed to 100% it all on my own, but I I can't be sure. Um, <laughs> because because if it was, that would probably be one of the very few games, along with like Super Mario World for the Game Boy Advance, that I can actually say I 100%ed 
totally on my own, like no outside help whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not very often that I do such a thing. Yeah, and this game is really difficult, hundred percent on your own without those hints. Uh, because that's actually, actually one thing I do enjoy about the game is that I mean, it's been doing Metroid's been doing this since uh, Super Metroid in terms of two D platformers. But when you whenever you go through an area, if there's an item in it, uh, it lets you know via a circle that there's an item nearby, and so uh, it just lets you know that hey, there's an item here. And uh, if you get that item, it turns to a dot. So you can look at your map afterwards and be like, oh, it looks like I missed these items over at this section. So I'm going to go back and try to get those and see and figure it out. And so that's one thing I do enjoy about the game. Oh, yeah, that ended up being very, very helpful for me. Once once Ryan informed me <laughs> of such feature. And I feel like I knew this uh, back in Fusion. It's just one of those things that you kind of have to jog your memory of. I mean, I don't know if it was like that in Fusion. I, I can't remember. It is. Okay. Yeah, it is. All right. But um, it's just one of those things you kind of have to jog your memory. I was telling Ryan, uh, as I was playing the game, I was like, I know, I've learned from Metroid Fusion, and I would start bombing like the area with like Morph Ball bomb. <laughs> Literally bombing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I learned from this game. Or there'd be certain situations where like normally you wouldn't think to do that, but I would do it because Fusion. So I thought that was fun. So do we talk about storytelling when we talk about gameplay? Uh, that would be more in the content section, I would believe. Okay, so... Um, that's gotcha. kind of where like plot and related things go. Ah, uh, um, okay, gotcha. So I'll save those points till then. On the topic of hints that you guys are just talking about, I, uh, I, I do have one more point I would like to make, but it's also kind of a question. And it's a question to both of you because you have both played and completed Metroid Fusion, whereas I have not. And... Uh, this touches on a critique that many other people have of Metroid Fusion. Um, in this game, in Zero Mission, there are many uh, Chozo statues that will give you hints as to where like the next important thing is. Whereas in Super Metroid, that was not the case. In Super Metroid, you were left entirely on your own. Um, I've heard that in Metroid Fusion, there is a lot of hand-holding as far as uh, the, the uh, artificial intelligence, I believe, uh, telling you where to go. And I was wondering if you guys could sort of tell me a little bit how you feel about that aspect of the game compared to Fusion, since I've never played it myself. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me let me take the reins on this one. I think I remember enough to know about this one. Yeah, the AI. Uh, I, you know, I say I know enough, but I don't really remember the the AI's name. But it's Adam. <laughs> it tells you. Yeah, it tells you to. It's basic. Basically, the game is divided up into many different sections. Um, and he will tell you to explore certain sections um, more so than really tell you where to go. Um, but there is kind of a lot more of hand-holding than there is, uh, I would say, a lot of other Metroid games. But um, I would s- there's still some exploration to it, and there's still the challenging factor of, like, they're not going to tell you how to get to these destinations. Sometimes you have to figure that out. Um, so... I fusion there's still a, quite a bit of like uh getting stuck um and and things like that but what fusion really brings to the table is it's I mean its story is really good its intensity is really good it's kind of creepy um and it's kind of like in like intense all the way throughout the game um so yeah I don't know it it does it's probably not and, and Ryan maybe able to elaborate more on this but it does kind of hold your hand in some areas but i would say i still say that it's challenging yeah so i'll i'll try my best to like not go too much in depth into fusion uh because you know this is a zero mission review (laughs) but zero missions actually i would call like a mix between how it does that between super metroid and fusion uh the reason why fusion does that just uh tldr is uh because the story uh, the story of the game takes the front seat and a lot of things change very quickly that uh, the AI needs to let you know about. So that's kind of why it's structured that way and actually works really well. Uh, so Fusion still very much gives you that exploration. It feels like a Metro game. But on to Zero Mission. Uh, Zero Mission, uh, I still think that feature is very handy, uh, especially for new incoming players. And so Zero Mission is a great game for... Uh, incoming people of the series to play. Uh, in my opinion, if anyone asks me, hey, I know you like Metroid, what's the first game I should play? I will always tell them Zero Mission. Um, 
And so, like, I, I just know for Kevin's sake, those Chosen statues were very helpful <laughs> oh, yes. when he played when he played those today, and it would be very daunting without it. And I do like how it just has a generic thing of, oh, here's a next useful item over here. It doesn't tell you, you know, how to get there. Is it truly the next item you get? All that stuff. Uh, I think one point or one point in the game that does this really well that a lot of people can't get stuck if they take it too literally is when you first go into Norfair. Because uh, the Chosen statue lets you know, hey, the ice beam is over here. That's let you know oh, what yeah. it is. But the yeah. it is the ice beam item. Uh, Kevin, amazingly, when he went down to Norfair, he went to the left. He Even <laughs> though the thing's on the right, he went to the left. I totally went to the right. And I tried to get up there, and I couldn't get up there because you have no power grip uh, yeah. to get yourself up there. And I just stood around there for the longest time. I was like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> and so what you're supposed to do is go all the way to the left and go to a different section entirely, uh, get these unknown items and the power grip, and then you go all the way back around. And so uh, yeah. that, so it still has that, uh, it's still very much that, Metroid exploration feel. It just kind of gives you a general direction of where to go. So you don't feel completely lost or hopeless. And so I think that's really good, especially for newer incoming players into the into the series. Yeah, yeah. Like I yeah. said, uh I learned from Fusion. I learned. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I agree that it's really helpful for uh new players. And it's also it's also gotten me out of a few binds when I was playing the game for the very first time shit over ten years ago, probably. Um and I do, I do like the fact that it is rather vague. It doesn't, it doesn't ever tell you what's waiting at the other Chozo statue. It just tells you that there is one over there that you should probably make your way to. And I think that makes a lot of sense given the setting of this game contrasted to Fusion, where Fusion, like the, the setting is totally different. Where you're on a station that has an AI that is, you know, trying to help you achieve a goal. Like you, you have a teammate basically. Mm-hmm. And in this game, you're in the depths of ZB's. Or Zebus, I don't know how you Zebus, actually pronounce it. Yeah, Zebus is how you <laughs> pronounce it. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin earlier was like, was like Zebes or it's and definitely stuff like that. Zebes. I'm, like, I'm sticking it's to it. It's like no, Kevin, it's Zebus. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to do years of reconditioning on me because I've been saying Zebes my whole life. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but what's really nice is that you know the Chozos are relics of times long gone, and they're you know they're not sentient beings who can tell you things. They're just kind of pointing you in a direction. And uh, I think that, yeah, that's a really nice balance to strike between being totally on your own and uh, being, I guess, handheld, to put it cynically, uh, by the AI infusion. And uh, w- what's also nice is just that the mini map in general is really helpful. Like, you know, in the original Metroid for the NES, you don't have a mini map. And I- I've never played that game like for more than 10 minutes. And I can't imagine <laughs> working your way through it without a mini map, even. Like, that just. Sounds not very fun to me. <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, feel free to change my mind, but it sounds like you won't. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this game, I think, addresses a problem that many people had with Fusion while at the same time staying true to what the game is and uh, and making it accessible as well. Yep. I, I do have one more little point I want to make on gameplay, and then maybe then we can move on because we've been talking for a very long time about the <laughs> gameplay, although yeah. there is a lot to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. And feel free if you guys have anything more to add, like I'm not in a huge rush. But um, one little critique I have is that I wish that I could disable upgrades whenever I wanted, which you could do in Super Metroid. But in this game, once you get an upgrade, you're uh, quote-unquote stuck with it. And... The reason that I would like the ability to remove upgrades would just be like to give myself a little challenge every now and then. Like if I've beaten the game already and I'm just running around for the sake of running around and destroying enemies, I think it'd be cool. Like, oh, I'm in uh I'm in the Ridley area where there's a lot of enemies with high health who have a high damage output. Let me just put on my regular suit and let me like get rid of my ice beam and my plasma beam or whatever and just, you know, try to challenge myself. I just think that would be a fun little thing to do. And I don't really understand necessarily why they removed that feature when it was present in a previous game. Yeah, and actually Super Metro is the only game with that feature. Um, really? It's not like that in any other one. Uh, so it's actually uh, normal Metroid, just uh, keep having your stuff and just uh, blow through enemies. But that is a good point, though. I never really looked at it that way before. 
Uh, and that actually segues to one of the points that I do criticize about uh, Zero Mission is that uh, to me, it's, I feel like it is the easiest Metro game in the series. Uh, and I think it's a little too easy sometimes. Uh, I mean, I was telling Kevin, you know, like, uh, Kevin, I know you really haven't played this game entirely through. Make sure you play in the normal difficulty instead of the easy difficulty. Uh, that is because I feel like difficulty in Metroid brings a lot to it gives you that, you know, fear of trying to live for yourself. Uh, it makes the environment a lot more hostile and gives you that feeling of isolation. Uh, Absolutely. But, but, but Zero Mission, though, definitely when you start to get really good, can get pretty easy. And so uh, that's one of my critiques on the game, actually, as a whole, uh, is that it's a little too easy for my taking. But still, uh, hard mode still gives you that challenge, though. And so I do enjoy that. Yeah, and uh, when we get to the content section, I would like to talk a little more about the uh, the presence of multiple difficulties. Um, but unless you guys have anything more to add, I think that's about it for the gameplay section. What do you all think? Yeah, let's... Uh, no, let's, I'm good to go. Let's uh, state our ratings. Sweet. Uh, Kevin, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. So I gave gameplay a solid, fat 89. Ooh, that's hot. And I gave mine as a uh, 92 uh, for all those things I said earlier. So, cool. A for me. <laughs> cool. Very solid. Well, I'm on the same page as y'all. I gave it a 5 out of 5. Ah, there you go. There you Sweet. Go. Sweet. All right. Well, uh, that segues us into aesthetics, um, where we first talk about aesthetics. visuals. Aesthetics. <laughs> um, so, let me... <laughs> Let me just take the reins, and I'll just start out by saying uh, that we played this on the Wii U, and I thought that was pretty cool, um, having that feature, um, just having it blown up on the screen. Like a Game Boy Advance game blown up on my big TV was very fun and cool to see, um, so I really enjoyed seeing it from that perspective. Um, looks a lot like Fusion, I would say, uh, but I wouldn't say that it stood out more to me than Fusion did. Um, but like I, but once again, it being a remake probably constrained it uh, somewhat. But um, yeah, no, I think it, it's a very good looking game. I don't see anything wrong with it. It's a really good looking. Uh, I, I feel similarly about it as I did uh, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. I felt it was a pretty pretty good looking game, um, Game Boy Advance game. I have no complaints. Um, it didn't wow me in graphics, even though I was able to see it in a huge, big screen. But um, yeah, I, there's a lot of visual cues that also helps with um, with the game as well uh, that I thought adds to the visuals. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think? I actually think it's one of the uh, best looking games on the Game Boy Advance. Uh, Hell yeah. And so I really do. And so uh, maybe because it was kind of blown up a little bit, but on the Game Boy Advance, it looks so, so good. And for the fact that it looked that good on the big TV, I think it's a testament to how good the game looks. Exactly. Uh, one thing I do enjoy about it is how varied the enemies look and how detailed even the bosses look. Uh, you know, I really appreciate... Uh, even though the environments, it's it's like all caverns, but for the fact that each place was still like visually different and recognizable, uh, I would come, you know, to a room, explore it, and then one thing really appreci appreciate about it is that you know I'll go somewhere else, and then when I come back later, I instantly look in my surroundings, like oh, I know exactly where I am. Uh, so you like you never forgot about it, even though you've only been there once. Uh, so all the places and rooms are very recognizable, uh, and the rooms are varied in such a way of, oh, this, this thing is here, I must be at this spot. Uh, and so there's very little copy and pasting at all throughout the game. And uh, I just really enjoyed how a lot of the textures and stuff in the background, it really is an alien world, uh, and that's something I really did enjoy. It's definitely not planet Earth. It's definitely not <laughs> a generic planet with a snow, jungle, you know, ruins or deserts, you know, all that stuff. It's very much a alien world, and there's still these different areas with that different twist to it. Uh, and so that's something that I really uh, appreciate about the visuals in this game. That's even more impressive when you consider the fact that 99% of the game takes place underground, and so if you're a 
designer or a yeah, if you're a designer for this game and you're thinking, oh, like how can I make one million caves all look different from each other? You know, this game does it, and it does it extremely well. Um, I have similar opinions. I think the visuals are absolutely gorgeous. I think they're very colorful, very detailed, uh, very gross when they need to be. Um, this is a Metroid <laughs> yeah. game. It's a very alien game. Everything's happening underground, and you're seeing kind of the the worst that Zebes has to offer. So, uh, you know, no surprises there. Um, not too gross. You know, they keep it pretty kid-friendly, but there are some things that have, like, weird holes in them and things that are slimy and make weird noises. Uh, well, that'll be in the audio section, but uh, <laughs> they definitely set the mood very well. Um, Kevin, you mentioned visual cues. One thing I want to mention about that is I love the feedback that you get whenever uh, you hit enemies. They always flash white when you hit them with a weapon, and the bosses all get redder as they approach death, which... Is a, is, I know it's a convention in Metroid games, and I'm sure it's a convention in other games as well. Probably things like Mega Man, I would imagine, do something similar to that. Um, but it is very satisfying. You get that reinforcement that, like, hey, you are doing stuff. You are, you are damaging this insanely large creature. Don't worry. You know, like, you're making progress. <laughs> yeah. I also love some of the little details that they add as far as animation goes. Uh, one of them that really stood out to me was the animation of Samus's ponytail when she's in her zero suit at the end of the game. (laughs) Um, Like if you, if you pay attention, her ponytail moves with, you know, it has gravity and it moves with all of her motions. It's a great detail. Even on the menu screen, if your save file is in the, uh, is in that segment of the game, like rather than the helmet, it'll show her uh, like her, you know, her exposed face with the ponytail and everything. And the ponytail will like move up and down as you're on the menu screen which blows my mind. Like, no one, nobody had to do that. Like, I don't think that that some supervisor told a designer, hey, you better do that. The designer was probably like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if they did this? And then you just, they just did it probably. Like, <laughs> that's, that's the level of detail that's present in some situations. And also in some areas that are particularly, like, old or dusty or ruinous, your feet will leave dust clouds wherever you walk or run or jump. Um but it's cool because it happens selectively. It doesn't happen in the entire game. So when it does happen, you're like, oh, this place is, you know, really dank and gross, <laughs> you know? Um, just, it, it's really just a bunch of little things, I think, that add up to the sense of world building and atmosphere and environments and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a, one thing, can we talk about the cutscenes though? Like, how good yes, are those? please. How They're good so are those? Good. <laughs> Like, thank you. I was like, they're the only ones that can pull like that kind of style of cutscenes off and make it work. Because I was like, I have seen nobody a- able to use that art style and make it work as such as a cutscene and make it feel still intense and like uh, just amazing. That was I love the cutscenes; those were great. I love the one when you're uh, you're entering Norfair for the first time and Mother Brain like has her gross ass eyeball that kind of appears from within the brain <laughs> and then you know she's she, like you see samus in her uh, in her eye and then her pupil contracts and it's it's so fucking epic it's awesome god <laughs> i i love cutscenes yeah yeah and that's actually something i want to oh, kind of get to later in the more of the story section and how great the cutscenes were in for storytelling uh but i agree they were definitely uh uh, very suspenseful, and I really love the uh, Ridley entry uh, scene when you fight him uh, for the first time. It's just yeah, all, all it is is it's a still image of Samus turn around when you turn around, but like zooms in super fast. So it's like oh shit, you know, <laughs> like, here comes Ridley, you know, and here he comes, and so here come that boy, <laughs> yeah, and so he just does it so well. It's just like oh gosh, you know, you're expecting him because he doesn't appear in the room the first time. But when it, when the cutscene happens, it just totally throws you off guard. You're like, oh, oh gosh, you know. So I really yeah. like that. One thing I wanted to mention, Ryan, this was to your point about um, about the variety in the environments and the way that you're able to tell where you are, kind of from the landscape. One thing that just stood out. I, I'd always noticed this playing the game, but it really just stood out to me today and yesterday when I was playing in advance for this episode. Is that every every main area in the game, like. Brinstar, Craid, Ridley, Norfair, they all have, I would say, at least three or even four distinct appearances that different sub-areas will take on. Mm-hmm. For example, Norfair is probably the, the most prominent example. They have, like, uh, caves that are pretty standard-looking, like, you know, just caves with brown and red rock. 
and they also have uh, areas that look more like ruins or like a temple where they have, you know, very distinct architecture. They have the famous green bubble rooms where everything is, you know, made of green bubbles. And they also have a variation of that where the bubbles are a lot bigger and darker and kind of more olive colored instead of bright green. So they also take on their own distinct appearance. And it's just incredible the way that they're able to do that oh, in varying ways with every single area, as I said, um, or all, all the ones that you spend a significant amount of time in anyway. And to me, it's just incredible that they're able to take all of those things. And although they do feel really weird, or they, they do sound weird when I say it out loud, like, oh, why does Norfair have like this architecture area mixed with green bubbles, mixed with caves? Like, when I step back, maybe it does strike me as odd, but when I'm when I'm playing the game, Maybe it's because I grew up with Super Metroid, but when I'm playing the game, it just seems perfectly cool. Like, oh, I'm in this section now. And it's a sign of progress, and it's, you know, visual variety that keeps me interested. And it's just crazy the amount of detail that went into all that work. Absolutely, I agree 100%. And actually, I, as a kid, I would uh, think of those uh, green bubbles as like eyeballs. I was like, ooh, this is gross. Oh, So weird. I definitely I first that thought that when I was a kid. So that was my... First, like I grasp onto, like, oh, green eyeballs. What is this place? And so <laughs> it's definitely not really that, but that was my first uh, thought when I saw that. Cool. I do have one more uh, visual point I would like to talk about. Um, and feel free, again, feel free to follow up if you guys have any more things you want to talk about. But I feel like you can't really talk about visuals in any Metroid game without talking about Samus appearing in her various states of undress at the end of the game. <laughs> depending on I your love completion it. rate. Oh, no. You know, Samus, Metroid has a has a long and storied history of uh, giving what is very arguably a sexist fan service, depending on your performance. And I think that with Fusion and with Zero Mission, they really started the era of like of featuring Samus repeatedly in those various states of undress. Now, if you go, I was actually researching this last night, not in a perverted way, mind you, but like in a purely <laughs> academic way. You know, oh, how, no. how has Samus appeared in previous Metroid games? Because I feel like it's kind of an important thing to look at. Um, in the original game, in Metroid 2 for the Game Boy, and in Super Metroid, like there are some outfits she appears in where she's like in like a leotard with like the, the tummy area cut out or like a bikini or like a bikini bottom and a tank top. And it's very like, it's very much like obvious fan service and it's kind of gross, right? Um, in Fusion and in Metroid Zero Mission, they tone it down a little bit. Um, I mean, then again, they do like emphasize, you know, the curves of her body with the Zero suit and stuff like that. At least in the ending cards that you can get for completing the game, she's wearing like a skirt sort of thing and a thing that resembles a halter top, I guess might be the word. So it's a little more like, it's it's a little more reasonable and a little more... Um, appropriate I guess would be the word than like a leotard or a bikini or something that just seems totally out of place but I do feel despite that I do feel that this is the era of Metroid games where Samus started becoming like um, what's the word a sex symbol of Nintendo where previously I would say there hadn't really been any as far as Nintendo itself was concerned yeah did, so did they just completely abandon uh, uh, Samus and went okay let's just do Bayonetta <laughs> and so I feel like that's that it's now Bayonetta. <laughs> it, it probably is. I don't know enough about. I was actually thinking about this. I don't know really anything about Bayonetta. Is, is she like a? Is she an actual Nintendo property? She's not like a guest star in Smash Bros. Or anything mm, like that? She's not officially a Nintendo IP for sure. Um, it's just Nintendo has a deal with whoever Bayonetta is with that uh, Bayonetta games are with Nintendo systems. So I that's okay. all I know. For that so like extent. a second party sort of thing rather than correct, a first party. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe Bayonetta is more obviously in that role now. And from the from the very very little disclaimer that I know about Bayonetta, it seems like maybe it suits her personality more. Like I I, th- I feel like they very much play her up to be a sex symbol. Um, and also I do want to say like this might get a little bit political or like a what's the word a social commentary. I, it's not in my place to say whether the existence of sex symbols is a bad or a good thing. I really don't know. I think that's for other people to decide, not me. Um, but it's just really interesting to see the way that 
Nintendo has treated Samus and the way that fans have treated Samus or reacted to Samus. Um, I know that there was a kind of a backlash whenever people saw that she was going to have basically jet powered high heels in Smash 4. That was kind of a thing. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm going with this. I guess I'm just saying like, <laughs> it's worth thinking about, uh, yeah. you know, the fan service. I'll just say that the fan service, <laughs> like it's just interesting thinking about that and the ways that Nintendo has treated it over time and the way that fans have reacted, you know, men and women and others, like everyone. I don't know. It's again, I don't really know where I'm going with this. It's just kind of a th- point of conversation. Well, I will say that, It does have all of that, but I feel like it doesn't need it. Like, I feel like the game itself, like, it it seems like they were trying to take a mature stance and uh, kind of point of view from the game. They're trying to, like, say, okay, this is a mature Nintendo game. But even if that's the stance or position or, like, uh, however they wanted to do things with Metroid, like, they really didn't need any of that. It's just, yeah, I guess fan service as you put it but yeah and yeah and my view on it is that uh i definitely do not uh see samus as a uh sex symbol or icon i mean the reason why they did that in the original metroid was for the shocking reveal that she was a woman and you know and in order to do that you know they kind of had to reveal her a little bit to make it obvious that she was a woman instead of a guy which everyone thought she was uh and so it was kind of like that you know, like, oh, look, you know, uh, if you beat the game fast enough, uh, you get to see that. And so that was kind of like a reward for being the game fast enough. Um, and just, uh, I think Samus as a character, uh, I think she kind of owns up that she is, you know, sexy and stuff. And it's a sexy badass. And so I think she <laughs> doesn't mind, you know, you know, uh, showing off <laughs> a little bit. But, you know, she I doesn't mind. She doesn't mind, so... <laughs> yeah, whatever. I just didn't ever really viewed it that way, uh, especially since, you know, if she really was truly a sex icon, then, you know, she would uh, definitely be... Uh, I would say they would make more of an effort to make her more uh, really revealing the game. The fact that you're playing the game in the various suit the entire time and all that stuff, I don't know. That's just my view on it. And so I, I don't think too much about it too so much but oh well (laughs) that's kind of my take on it your point about them needing to make it somewhat obvious that she was a woman i think that is a fairly strong point i uh i've never you know like completed metroid so i've never like seen i guess the the various states of undress there is the famous justin bailey cheat which i did use for the sake of (laughs) the novelty um kevin do you know about justin bailey uh yeah, Ryan's told me about it a little bit. Yeah, so um so so from that from that standpoint I do get it. And I do think that the fact that Samus is a woman at all, period, was really cool, especially at that time. That's probably a time when, you know, there were fewer cool female uh, you know, tough, strong characters who were well, tough and strong basically. Again, this is sort of out of my depth. I don't know too much about the the gender issues of the time. Right. But maybe, I guess what I'm saying is maybe once people knew that Samus was a woman, maybe they made the fan service, you know, a little bit lesser. Like, there's nothing wrong with being sexy. There's nothing wrong with sexy women. It's just that sometimes it feels like too blatant of fan service. And that's something that I don't know is all that good or not. Right. Well, uh, that's a that's a good point. A uh, good point of view. Uh, does that about do it for y'all's visuals, though? <laughs> <laughs> it That's does it for me. me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh yeah. So moving on to audio and uh we'll kinda Wait, 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 wait. Gotta give our ratings, dog. Oh, uh, I was about to Yo. mention we could give an aesthetics total after we do audio. But uh we could do it, however. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I do visuals separately and I have been, so I was wondering if I could at least give mine first. Um so what'd you give it? I gave it a Hot, fresh, chocolate filled, Ooh, straight out chocolate. of the oven, five out of five. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Possibly the easiest five out of five I've ever given on this podcast. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay. Wow. Um, well, I gave it an eighty nine. Very nice. 
Yeah, and I gave it a 95. Uh, I don't have a fancy phrase to go with that 95, other than it's a 95. So there we go. <laughs> cool. Sweet. Um, so that brings us to audio portion of uh, aesthetics. Um, I'll start out by saying that, you know what? No, Ryan, I want you to take it away from audio because I know you are passionate about this soundtrack. Oh, yes. So uh, for those who don't know, I one of the reasons why... Uh, Kevin and Peter invited me on this uh, podcast is because uh, Metroid is my favorite video game series. I don't know if I said that already. I don't think I don't think I have, so that's why I'm saying it now. Uh, but one of the reasons why uh, Metroid means a lot to me is because of the music, uh, and this is easily has the highest rated for me in this game. Uh, I can just go all day about the music, and I'll try to constrict it as much as I can. Uh, but the tunes are so memorable and are very catchy. Uh, they just stick with you forever. Uh, you just hear the start of the Brinstar uh, theme, and you can finish it without it continuing. Uh, I also love uh, the um, the Kraid theme is also very memorable. And they even improved a lot of new songs, or they improved a lot of the old songs from the original and made it way better. Like, Norfair is even, like, very daunting, and, you know, it's hard, hardcore kind of type. And uh, the Ridley place, not the Ridley battle, is very like eerie and like uh, like mysterious kind of like you don't know what's going to be around the corner. Uh, uh, I love the boss themes too. I think Craig and Ridley are done really really well, uh, and the tunes just give you a sense of eeriness, but they're still very varied and memorable. And so yeah, uh, I love the music of this game so much. Yeah, um, I agree on the eerie thing. Uh, they definitely did a really good job of making it feel really eerie. Um, not only did they do a good job of that, but they did a good job of the sense of urgency in some of their uh, tunes, and uh, where like all of a sudden it would pick up and like uh, some intense thing would happen. Particularly, you know, when you got caught by a space pirate in a zero suit. Uh, and the alarm goes off and everything. They do a really good job, not only in this game, but in Fusion as well, of creating urgency with their soundtrack. So that was really cool, I I thought. Yeah, I agree. Um, Ryan, I agree with you that the music, well, I guess both of you have said this, but yeah, the music in Metroid is and always has been a really defining factor of the game, and it's always been very memorable, very catchy. Um, one thing I do want to mention this is a this is a comparison to Super Metroid, as are many things that I've said already. But in Super Metroid, I feel that in general, with a few very obvious exceptions, the music is a little more atmospheric. Um, for example, let, let's think about the the Ridley area theme music in this game, where, as you said, Ryan, it's very much uh, it's very eerie, very uh, spooky and atmospheric. Um, but a lot of the other tracks in this game are very much you know they're very much pieces of music that you can focus on that have very distinct melodies and percussion and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, whereas in Super Metroid, most of it was a little more like the Ridley theme in this game where things are more atmospheric and uh, darker and moodier and maybe a little more uncertain. And so I was wondering, um, I mean, it's very clear to me that you guys all like the music and I do too. So this isn't me detracting from the game or even critiquing it really. I'm just kind of wondering if it makes a difference and if so, what kind of difference that maybe the music in this game is a little more uh, attention grabbing and a little more urgent than some of the more subtle, creepy vibes of uh, of other songs or of other Metroid games. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I think it depends on the place. I think for Brinstar, you know, that song is just perfect. You know, it's the first place in the game. It's like the main, I guess, I don't know if I want to call it a hub world, but it's the world or the area that connects all the other areas. Uh, very well so you spend a lot of time just passing through and it's the first area that you really get a sense of uh, and that theme is very it's a very upbeat catchy theme uh, not so much atmospheric and I think that really fits it really well uh, whereas some places like Criteria which is you know the, the surface of the planet uh, when you go there for the first time you're just uh, it does a great job of just like giving you that Ooh, you know, this place is really different. What, are, what am I getting myself into? Uh, and so I think it kind of depends, but I actually really like a lot of those catchier themes. Uh, I think Craig's theme is just an example of that because um, it still is kind of a little bit atmospheric, but at the same time, it's just so catchy. 
And so I, I just love it. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about is if you're playing the game and you're kind of in the same area for a long time, whether you're stuck or whether you're just taking your time, I was wondering if maybe the songs get annoying after a while because they are ah. very catchy and very focusing. But from from my experience, having played the game for so many hours over the past you know many years, I've never really been annoyed by the music. So I guess it's kind of a moot point. <laughs> maybe some people yeah. might be. Yeah, I think the only song in the entire game that does get on my nerves, I wrote it down specifically as the only negative for sound, was uh, the Imago theme. And Imago is that uh, Wasp boss or Bee boss that you were alluding to earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so I guess, <laughs> I, I guess it does its good job. I guess it does its good job because, you know, like, oh, you know, it's like he's after you and he's a pest and he's annoying and stuff like that. But if you actually just sit down and listen to that song, it definitely gets old real quick. So that's like the yeah. only song in the game that I'm just like, okay, I could definitely go the rest of my life without hearing this again. <laughs> that's the type of song where uh, on the official soundtrack, it would last about 15 seconds maybe before fading yep. out. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> All the other ones give them like two minutes. This one, you get 15 seconds. Yep. <laughs> um, on that note, actually, I did want to say that I really appreciate the variety of boss themes that there are. Most of the Most of the mini bosses have unique themes. There's maybe two out of the four or five mini bosses that have the same theme. And then also the main bosses have their own distinct themes as well. And that's something that, um, you know, again, they didn't really have to do it. They just did. And the themes that they chose for the different boss battles all fit the theme of the battle very well. Or not the theme of the battle, but they fit the the urgency or the the movement of the battle very well. Like, as you mentioned, the uh, Imago, was that its name? The Wasp? That, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I had so, to look it up you know, earlier today. <laughs> for its, uh, He actually has his name. So that, you know, that one's very, and you're like, oh, fuck, yep. like, I, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> so we so kill it quickly. And then there are other ones where uh, the mini boss of Norfair, or I guess it's the main boss, it's like the, the slug that's dangling from the ceiling. That one, it has a very loping sort of, a, like, like a dizzy sort of piano line, because in that battle, you do kind of take your time a little more, you wait for things more. Um, and it's really impressive the way that they managed to uh, incorporate the gameplay and the music in that way for those battles. Mm. And fun fact, if you did not know, that boss is the very early stage of Imago. So I don't know if you know that, actually. I sort so, of picked up on it from the fact that there were a bunch of like similar slug creatures in Norfair, and they all kind of... Yeah, because like, when you knock it down, it, it, it just lands there on the ground, and you go to Ridley for the first time. Kevin definitely got frustrated by this. Because when you go to Ridley for the first time, oh, yeah. you know, the cussing <laughs> happens, Ridley comes out, rah, you know, it's like, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. And then you get there and you're stuck. You can't go anywhere uh, yeah, just because there's a super missile door and stuff. And you can see that blue uh, slug that it looks very similar that you just defeated making a cocoon right up there if you go to the top. And so that's kind of the game's hint of saying, hey, how did this thing get down here? And so it's kind of your hint to go back up to Norfair go back to that spot, notice that the thing's not there, and it dug a tunnel all the way to where you uh, saw it. And when you follow it through that tunnel, uh, you notice that it's hatched from its cocoon, and then that's when you go fight it. So it's actually all the same enemy. So fun fact. Fun fact, I actually accidentally sequence broke earlier today because I got early super missiles oh, from some uh, speed boost trickery. I know which one I, you're talking about. It's in Brinstar, right? Yeah, the one where you have to yeah. like go through the crazy sequence um, with some morph ball shit. But yeah, I because because I remember that you get the super missiles normally after the uh, the Imago fight, and then I accidentally got these these ones, and I was like, oh cool, I can you know sequence break. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't I don't know how much sequence breaking there is in this game um, because I haven't really watched speed runs or anything of it. I do know that it's a obviously a huge part of playing Super Metroid if you wish to make it so. Um, I believe but, uh, the only thing that it sequence breaks is that you can skip Imago entirely. At least the, okay, so, the, the flying form, and that's it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. that's all you could do with it. Uh, so, um, I, I want to be cautious of time, because I know we've got a lot to say about content coming up. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, I, really, I really dig the sounds of this game and the way that it feels so not only natural, but it just feels so right the way most of the moves and the, the shots and the, like, like when you're firing your beam and stuff, it's the simple things like that of how it sounds, the way the game sounds, really, I really enjoyed that aspect. Um, 
of the audio. Yeah, to add to a little bit, I actually love their differences for uh, the missiles and the super missiles. Super missiles are like, to me, is one of the most satisfying things to fire because that extra crunch or power of the sound effect that it gives, it's like, oh, shoot, you know, <laughs> when you fire it. And so just that difference between uh, a missile and the super missile is like, oh, it's, uh, it makes all the differences. What about the super morph ball where it goes? Oh, the power bomb. That's a good one, yeah. too. And I actually, uh, um, I don't think this is a very popular opinion, but uh, Metroid Zero Mission actually has my favorite screw attack sound. Oh, no. And so That's awful. So it's definitely my favorite. I know Kevin disagrees. <laughs> but how do you feel about that, Peter? How do you feel about the screw attack sound? Um, is it the one where it goes like... No, it's... Like, come like that. <laughs> well, because I, uh, I know that in Super Metroid, it's more like a... Like higher pitch. Yeah, and this one, I think, is more subtle. Um, I, I, I like it. So. I actually... I didn't spend most of my time playing on a save file where I had the screw attack, so I can't comment. For sure. Gotcha. Um, but I do want to say in general, I agree with both of you. The sound effects are extremely satisfying. They have that uh, that traditional GBA kind of crunch to them across the board. Mm-hmm. I also really appreciate how many of the enemies have unique sound effects when you damage them. Um, I'm sure that some of them are reused, but a lot of them have like very obviously distinct sound effects. Like, like you know, the minor enemies, not even the mini bosses. And again, that's something that they didn't have to do, but they did. And I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, one more thing uh, is that I was telling Kevin this earlier. One of my favorite sound effects in the entire game is when you get the unknown items that your suit cannot originally comprehend, and it just makes this like mystery sound. And I was telling Kevin, man, you could just like add this sound effect to any suspenseful situation and just make it that much more intense. It's yeah, like ooh, I agree. Dun, really dun, dun, dun. Yeah, he tried to make like, a Kevin. joke about it yesterday, and it went totally <laughs> over our heads. <laughs> I tried. It's like, Kevin, we're out of beer. Do, yeah, dun, dun, dun. Like, so I don't know if you like <laughs> enter it into this <laughs> podcast, but that would be great. I love that sound effect so much. I can listen to it all day. Yeah, but um, that about does it for me on audio. I don't know about you guys, but... Uh, I'm also finished. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> cool. Well, I gave it a hot and fresh 88. And uh, I gave it a 98. Uh, like I said, I have virtually no complaints with the uh sound and it's one of my favorite sound checks of all time so 98 for me Woo. pretty high but i love it yeah. i love it <laughs> wow i think that might be the highest individual out of 100 rating that anyone's ever given on the show it is it is yeah damn well you know i'm a little more generous with mine given that my scale is much much smaller but i'm gonna agree with both of you basically and give it a hot fresh solid chocolate filled five out of five Chocolate filled. All right. (laughs) Cool. Well, that moves us on to our last section of the game. Uh, Content, which I know we all have a lot to say about. Um, Peter, why don't you start us off on this one? Um, I feel like you have, this is is your forte. You love this section. You know I love content. Yeah. Um, You know this game, I I do feel it's a little short, and I would be happy to hear you guys' opinion on that in a second here. Um, it's fairly easy to complete. I'd say after the first time you play it, it's fairly easy to complete in a short amount of time. Like you could pretty easily do it in a day. I feel if you're good at the game, but um, given what the game does, I think that's probably okay because it is a retelling of the original Metroid game. Um, You know, it's stays fairly faithful. It does have the entire ending section, which is all new. And in my opinion, it's totally excellent what they did with the ending. I think that the, uh, the post mother brain content is amazing. As we discussed earlier, you uh, escape Zebes only to be shot down, and then you have to find your way out of the space pirate mothership. You get your suit back, you wreak havoc, and then you leave. I just think that entire sequence is awesome. I think it adds so much to the game. Um, it's a, It certainly took me for a loop the first time I played it. I did not expect it at all. And um, it was just really excellent. Um, and, and the scope of it, too, like the... The areas that you explore at the very end of the game, the space pirate ship and the the Chozo ruins, uh, Chozodia, they're very huge areas. Like you, it takes you a while to get through it. Um, so you know they weren't like skimping. They weren't just saying, "Oh, this is an afterthought." You know, have this little. You know, they weren't. They were not doing that. They were giving you substance at the end, and that really plays a lot into the uh, the high content rating that I will give at the end. Um, it's just 
just fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. No, I, I agree for you with, with the most part on that. Um, one of the things uh, I thought that Ryan informed me on was that you can uh, you can unlock the uh, OG Metroid game uh, if you I can't remember how you do it, Ryan. But you just uh, beat the game once. Oh, okay. Well, then I unlocked on it. on any difficulty. Cool. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but, Congratulations. But I also do think that uh, it is short in length, but that kind of increases its. Uh, replayability a little bit and and then the fact that it's so it's a little bit it's got some good intensity to it so i think it's got a lot of good replay value so i agree yeah i think uh i think this game uh sets the new standard or back then for remakes like this is like uh, in my opinion one of the greatest remakes you know period you know just bringing out the original metroid and making it you know this awesome to play uh, like if I ever want to do a run of the entire series in chronological order, I would definitely play Zero Mission instead of the original. Like it's that good, um, and it's it's great for people to experience that instead of trying to go with some of the dated struggles of the original. Uh, and so that's something that we do have to uh, I do have to say is that it's a it sets a standard for remakes. But it is very short. Uh, that's kind of one of my critiques on the game is that you know you can definitely easily beat it, especially when you get really good under two or even under an hour, even. Um, but however, to uh, uh, what's really great about it though is that the game is a lot of fun to play through again, and it has a uh, great replay value. And speedrunning is very encouraged, especially with the different endings and everything that you can get. Uh, so the game is almost like it wants you to play it through multiple times. Absolutely. And so, Peter, I know we both have played it. We both played through this game more than five times, you know, and that's because uh, not only do we want to play it again, but we want to see, you know, how we can do it, you know, how fast we can do different sections or whether it's you didn't get all the items last time, you want to get them this time. Uh, And also a really cool thing about it is that uh, if you can unlock hard mode after you defeat it on easy or normal the first time, and on the hard difficulty, I believe it's the same difficulty as normal. Uh, the only difference is, is that energy tanks give you 49 additional health instead of 99. And missiles give you 2 instead of 5. And super missiles are 1 instead of 2. So basically, all your supplies are halved. So it's like, oh, cool, you went through normal. Now do the exact same thing, but with like half of everything. And so it actually makes it for a pretty unique challenge. And if you beat the game on hard mode, you unlock a, a soundtrack in the game itself. So that's also a pretty cool unlockable that you can get as well. I agree. I think that the unlockables in this game are, uh, K- Kevin, you know, I'm passionate about unlockables. I think this game does it right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, compared to at least one other one that we've reviewed. Um, I do like the hard mode. I, I think Ryan, one other difference might be that some of the enemies are replaced with the, uh, more difficult palette swaps. Of oh, themselves. that's right. I forgot about that. Um, but other than that, yeah, the, the, the items being halved definitely, struck me the first time I ever played hard mode. I was like, oh shit, like this is getting real. <laughs> right. Um, but but to your point earlier about um, the game being fun to play multiple times, a perfect ex- example of that, and this happened without me even realizing it, is that last night I was looking at some of my save files and I had like two 100% save files and then a third one near the end of the game. And I thought, you know, I'm going to clean it up a little bit. I'm going to delete two of my save files and keep my like OG 100% one. And then... After I cleared one of them, I thought, oh, like I can't start from hard mode. After I've cleared a save file, I have to uh, beat it again on normal. But then I thought about it. It's like, oh, that's not even a big deal because I can beat the game in like, you know, a couple hours, just <laughs> in an afternoon. Yeah. And uh, and sometimes that might be, you know, that does speak to the game being short, obviously, which some people might not appreciate. And sometimes I do want a longer game. But in this game, I think it's okay for the reasons that we've talked about, like for there are at least three reasons. First, the fact that it's a remake of a game that exists already, and then they want to encourage speed running and all these other things. It's probably fine for it to be short and sweet and to the point, because the rest of the game, as we've gone through, you know, literally on this podcast, the rest of the game is just so good. It holds up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually one of the the notes I have on content. It says. Uh, well, and and this is a point I want to I do want to mention. Uh, honestly, the content doesn't particularly wow me. 
at all. I mean, it kind of does in some ways, but it kind of does in others. Um, it wows me in the other areas um, that I rated so high, but I would say that more of the extra content doesn't really like, there's nothing to go home and brag about in my opinion. Um, but I do think the content holds up, which is something I have verbatim, <laughs> uh, in my notes, which I thought was funny that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I think there's something to be said about short games and it's not even really a short game. It's like a medium length game, but there's something to be said about these games that you can play over and over again that especially, you know, people, I hate to say this phrase, but people our age, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't have a lot of time to go back and play these games that we've loved. And uh, Zero Mission kind of enables you to do that. And the fact that I was able to beat this game uh, without ever having to play it and have it ready and able for the podcast, I thought was really good. But um, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah, actually, to that point, this is the first game we've reviewed that uh, that not all of us, or not both of us, have played extensively as a kid. And uh, we, we might do some more games in the future. Like, there's a game, not to spoil anything, there is a game I want to play for the podcast, and it'll be the first time I've ever, you know, actually played it. Um, and so I'll I'll have that experience as well. But it, it's been really cool, I think, Kevin, that you were able to, as you said, complete this game essentially in one sitting. It sounds like maybe, you know, two days um, in time for the podcast. And that's that's a really exciting possibility. Like, if there are games that we can do that for, that's amazing because that just increases the number of games you can talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, and if we're tying in story to it, I did enjoy the fact that you are experiencing, and, and in a remade version, nonetheless, uh, Samus's first real mission. You know what I mean? Like, as Ryan was informing me, like, you are experiencing like her first greatest mission and you're like, okay. And uh, I don't remember why it's called the zero mission, but in, in programming, and this is what I want to assume, zero is like the zeroth index is the first or the starting point of every uh, data structure or array. So not to get too nerdy there, but um, <laughs> God forbid. yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of how I viewed it. <laughs> that's cool, actually. Yeah. Ryan, do you want to talk about storytelling a little bit? It's something that you hinted at previously. Uh, yeah, so uh, something that I really liked about Zero Mission is that I know you alluded to the cutscenes earlier, and uh, I think the cutscenes do a very good job of the storytelling, even though there there is no dialogue. Uh, obviously, there is some quotes from Samus. There is when the game starts, and I think that's a great uh, couple uh Quick uh, quote by Samus, but um, just a, just the cutscenes, you know, is the storytelling, and it tells you that oh, you know, like the space parts are aware of you, you know, Ridley's turning the ship around to come at you, or like oh, Mother Brain's aware that you're here, she's watching your every move, or you know, all those kind of things, and so uh, I really do appreciate what the cutscenes do to the story without uh, the story being like like one elaborate you know, text thing, just telling you what it is. You know, the story is kind of there and it's up to a lot of interpretation a little bit almost, but it, it lets you, uh, it lets you like have a little bit of a mystery to it as well. So I really appreciate the story of this game. I totally agree. Um, I, I think that in these earlier Metroid games, uh, I guess with the exception of fusion and the other games, the stories were fairly simple but they were very effective. And uh, this game, I think, plays on that strength by just giving you the bare minimum, right? Like, you know that you're on this planet. You know you have to exterminate the Metroids. You know that Ridley and Mother Brain are aware of you, and that's kind of enough to get you going and enough to feel the intensity. They don't have to have dialogue or anything like that. So, yeah, it definitely pulls it off in a very special way. Right. Um, there is one area of the storytelling I do want to get a little critical about, is the story as great as it is because of what we know comes afterwards chronologically? But looking at the story itself, if you knew nothing else about, or the story that Zero Mission tells, if you knew nothing about else about Metroid, is it like an amazing story? It's not a bad one, and it's still pretty cool and intense, but is it as, is it as hype as it is um, with the other games included? Or without, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's I a would great like to speak question. To this. Uh, yeah, Ryan, if you don't mind, since I have a little more of an outsider's perspective than you do, I'd like to talk about this first. 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Thanks. So I, I guess I want to kind of qualify what I said earlier by saying that the story, I wouldn't say it's amazing in the sense that there's a whole lot of drama and like you're totally invested in all the characters or anything like that. Uh, like I said earlier, it's very simple. You have a mission and there are people that are going to try to stop you because, you know, they're on the other side of it. Um, but I, I think that for a game like this, where so much of it is based on the atmosphere and the sense of dread and isolation, all that stuff, I think that's really perfectly fine. And so in that sense, I think that the story is, it, it's amazingly executed is what I would say. The story itself, it's not, you know, it's not J.R.R. or Tolkien or anything like that. It's just, <laughs> it's just you doing, doing your shit and you got to do it. Yeah, right. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I know what happens in Super Metroid, although in Super Metroid, it's essentially this again, really. Um, yeah, it's true. <laughs> as far as the other games go, I am a bit of an outsider, so maybe Ryan can fill in to talk about the other side of this question. But I think that this game in particular has its story, it does it well, and that's all that it needs to do. Mm. Yeah, uh, so Metroid actually has a pretty in-depth story, uh, but a lot of it is kind of, you have to kind of look into it almost. That's something that I think is a good thing about Metroid is that um, a lot of the series, you know, the story is not really shoved in your face for the most part. It's it's there if you want it. You know, like in the Prime games, you know, you you can play through the entire game of Metroid Prime without knowing literally anything about the story or you can know everything. And that's just if you want to actually sit down and read the the lures that you read in the walls, if you read the space part logs and there are computers when you walk by, you know, it's all optional. Uh, and so for the most part, Metroid's kind of that way. I know when Chris, uh, Kevin's friend Chris was over last night, he was asking a lot of kind of Metroid questions of yeah. what what's going on in the story. I'm able to answer it because one, I'm a fan, but two, uh, fun fact, before the release of Zero Mission, uh, Nintendo actually made two volumes of Metroid uh, uh, manga before this. Oh, sweet. And so the manga is two volumes. It's actually really good. I encourage anyone listening that is interested in the story of Samus and Metroid to check it out. Uh, it's very easy to Google search and find it. Um, but it actually goes all the way from her as a kid when her parents were killed by Ridley uh, in front of her all the way to her accepting this uh mission the zero mission from the galactic federation and so it, it tackles everything in between there's actually a lot that goes on uh and so uh, it's kind of one of those series where you don't need the story to enjoy the game and uh, appreciate it but it's there if you want to dive into it it's actually a well done story i think for the most part i would argue that that might be the best type of game where you know the story is optional <laughs> yeah 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 i guess so um I would say that kind of, in terms of how I feel about the content, like I said, it doesn't wow me, but I think it's good. Um, and I think it holds up. So that's kind of my TLDR on that. I agree with Kevin on that, for sure. I don't really have anything more to say, but yeah. I have one little thing I want to ask Ryan. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that I do really love how they show a glimpse of Samus's childhood with the Chozo mm -hmm. um, near the end of this game. And I think this might be the first ever like clear depiction of that going on, um, along with the manga that you mentioned. Do you know if that's accurate? Like if this is the first time we see Samus as a kid with the Chozo? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, that's, you nailed it. Um, so Because I believe the, you know, the games before, uh, Fusion, it's a lot of storytelling that goes on, but a lot of that's, you know, not involving her in the Chozo. Uh, Metroid Prime doesn't really touch on that too much. Uh, Super Metroid, other than that, you know, you're at Zebus and there's Chozo statues and everywhere, it doesn't really tackle that too much. Uh, so for the most part, I think what's known is that Samus was, you know, raised by the Chozo, and that's basically all you knew. I think some of the games tackled that beforehand. But this is the first time where Zero Mission really goes out of its way and say, no, this is like Samus's origin kind of and i think that was really cool that they did that yeah sweet uh well that does it for me in terms of content yeah uh, i'm about done too yeah yep <laughs> same here all right so cool i uh let me let me give my rating so uh 
I gave it a, I gave it a, it doesn't wow me. TLDR doesn't wow me, but I think it's good overall. I think that brings my score for content to an 84. Wow, Kevin, we, we are basically matching. Uh, I'm an 85 on the content. Wow. Ooh, wow. So, yep. We're basically matching there. Wow. Great minds. Yeah. Well, Peter. So I'm torn on this, actually. I, uh, couldn't really decide between a four and a five, which is funny because that would come out to a, a ninety on you guys' <laughs> scale. Um, right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna round down to a four, kind of for the sake of not giving it all fives. I don't know if that's flawed or not, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna give it a four out of five for content, but uh, okay. close to a five in my opinion. Okay, there you go. Would it be so wrong for you to say four point five out of five? It would, Kevin. Actually. I'm a man of principle. <laughs> okay. All I chose right, a scale right. for a reason. I'm going to stick to it. All right. Yeah, so, 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 <laughs> that rounds me out to an, I believe it's an 88 overall. And I'm at a 93. Uh, okay. I think this is definitely a game for me. And it's, uh, I love this game and it means a lot to me. And yeah, 93. That brings me up to a 95. 95. That's good. So, uh, something we haven't really been doing uh, for these podcasts, and I think we should start doing, and I kind of want to bring it back into this episode. Um, Averaging all the scores together, getting our IG score. No, we have done that, haven't we? But we do that, but we haven't uh, said where it placed amongst our rankings. So, um, that brings us at a 92 for all of our IG scores combined together. Um, including Ryan's in, um, and looking at it, a ninety-two brings that slightly below Star Fox sixty-four. So that brings us as the number two game on our podcast out of five. Right. Nice, Ryan. Could you remind me what your overall score was? Uh, ninety-three. Ninety-three. Kevin, yours was an eighty something. Eighty-eight. Okay. Cool. It was 87.5 rounded up to 88 because I just skipped the formalities that, you know, you hate so much. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, as far as the rating goes among the other games we've rated, it sounds kind of right to me. I think that this game is, uh, it was very universally acclaimed. I actually did go and look uh, look it up on Metacritic and I believe it has a 90 average. Mm-hmm. So uh, 89. But, yeah. 89. I'm sorry, I was off by one small <laughs> insignificant hey, that one <laughs> point matters nah but uh yeah this game this game definitely has a strong legacy i believe it's a uh I, I believe that within the metroid community specifically it's probably a quite revered game uh ryan you might have a little more insight onto that but uh yeah it's it's uh, it's an amazing game and the ratings that we've given speak for themselves yeah it's uh definitely important uh especially in terms of being able to really appreciate and fully uh, enjoy the original Metroid and what that is. Uh, I think I've kind of forgot to talk about this a little bit in the content session uh, section, but uh, one thing that it does do really well is that it doesn't like change the identity of the original Metroid. It still trace plays uh, true to it in spirit. Uh, and so, and actually fun fact, you know, uh, I was talking about the physics earlier uh, this was the physics engine that was used in the fan remake of AM2R, another Metroid 2 remake. Uh, so if you enjoy the feeling of this game, uh, AM2R actually uses its exact engine. And so, yeah, fun I, fact. I played a little bit of AM2R. I never played the whole thing, but uh, yeah, I did notice the physics were very similar to this. Um, Metroid fans out there, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't manage to check out AM2R. I say this having not played the it's whole amazing. thing, so I've it's done myself incredible. a disservice. Also, Nintendo, please don't take us down for referencing the game. <laughs> I'm sure Nintendo cares a lot about our podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just extremely saying. worried now. We might, we might just have just saying. ruined the podcast for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, cool. I, I'm i okay with it being the number two game on our our podcast. I, I, I'm pretty, pretty satisfied with that. But um, we are kind of running, running on time here. So if y'all don't mind, can I get over to the quick attack section? I have one suggestion. Okay. So since this is a Metroid game, can we call this the screw attack section? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Ryan, you're a goddamn genius. 
You might have to change the uh, the intro for that then. <laughs> no, what I was going to say was, uh, since there are three of us, if we're keeping with the Pokemon theme, since there are three of us, it could be the try attack section, since that is a Pokemon move. Yeah, I like Ryan's better. <laughs> it's more topical, that's for sure. I'll give it yeah. that. <laughs> also, check out my words for this uh, podcast, or this episode's uh, quick attack or screw attack section. You you ready for this? It's so fitting. All right, I'm ready. Zero or hero? Yo! <laughs> wow, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. You're so smart. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I am super impressed right now. Yeah. <laughs> so zero. I was hero. worrying in my head. I was like, "What's it going to be?" And it's like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, too good, man. All right. Well, without further ado, here we go. All right, so. This one's pretty interesting. A student has met a retweet goal to change their AP chemistry exam to a Fortnite exam. Uh, are you are you thinking this guy is a zero or are you thinking he's a hero? Uh, so I actually saw this news earlier because I think you like retweeted it or something. Um, yeah. So so maybe be conscious of that <laughs> if it's something you want to put on cool <laughs> attacks. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be bold here and say zero. I'm gonna say that's not cool. Probably screwed over some oh. kids who never played Fortnite. You're probably doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not like a academic head or anything like that. But come on, man. I, I'm assuming it's a boy. I, I just have to. I'm sorry. Um, come on, man. Yeah. So wait, is this is this a teacher that's doing this? The this, the teacher said, if you meet a certain amount of retweets, that we will change our AP Chemistry exam to a Fortnite exam. Gotcha. Uh Oh, I have to pick one, don't I? Yeah. I, I I guess zero, but not by much. I mean, I think it's fun and, you know, kind of funny. And, you know, I bet a lot of the students wouldn't mind it at all, or maybe most of them. But still, you know, it's kind of like a slippery slope. Like, if you if you let this slide, then you let other things slide. So I guess zero. Uh, I kind of signed with Peter on this, but I still think it's a... Fun idea, but still uh, zero. My my girlfriend over here is she's saying, uh, Katie, she's saying zero because she's a chemistry major. But I I would personally say hero, but that's just me. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, today is the one year anniversary of the Switch and Breath of the Wild. Um, so zero or hero, man? Oh, I'm here all the way. Uh, the Switch has been a fantastic uh, console. Uh, both of you should definitely get it, by the way. It's so good. And Breath of the Wild is actually the game that uh, I'm definitely playing most of my free time right now. I uh, didn't really start playing or getting into it until earlier this month, but I'm already past 50 hours in. I'm loving it every second of it, so hero. Yeah, I'm still mad at myself that I haven't played Breath of the Wild yet. There's a few things preventing me from doing so as much as I would like to, but I, I I've been keeping myself away from, like, too many details of the game. I've I've seen like barely any gameplay of it, but I know that it's extremely good from everything that I've read and the few things I've seen. Uh, so yeah, I'd be an idiot not to say hero. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Well, uh, moving on to our next fact. Um, it is rumored, I guess it's not a fact, but it is rumored that Diablo 3 is coming to the Switch. Zero or hero? Didn't... I thought that already happened, or like some Diablo was on the Switch... Uh, it might be Doom. You might be Doom, thinking of. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe. Um. Well, I think so. That was yeah. Yeah, I don't know too much about Diablo. Um, I do know that Diablo Two is an incredibly successful game, and I don't see any problem with the franchise coming <laughs> to a Nintendo console. Um, similar. To, I, I think I felt a similar way about Dark Souls. Um, I feel a similar way about Skyrim, which made its appearance on the Switch, I believe, a little while ago. Um, right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say hero man. The more people that play great games, the better. I'm the same way. I actually, uh, since I never owned uh, a PS3 or an Xbox 360, I never played Dark Souls before. And so when it's coming out on the Switch, uh, I actually will be playing it for the first time when it comes out on remaster. So I'm looking forward to that because I know it's a great game. I heard amazing things about it. And so I'm all for uh, Nintendo getting third-party games over to the Switch. It needs more of it. So, Hero. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, So our last one, and it's going to hit a little close to home for one of of us here on the podcast. 
your boy Tony Hawk has announced that he has parted ways with Activision. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, sigh. Well, <laughs> it's the end of an era, but if you look at... I, I don't actually I don't actually know if Activision was responsible for the fucking travesty that was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater <laughs> 5. I kind of assume that they were, given the name of the game. Um, I, I, I do know that Neversoft, which is the OG Tony Hawk developer, they did not develop that game. Some other bullshit did, did that. Um I'm sad it's the end of an era, but I think that better things are in the future for uh, for the Birdman, as we call him in the community. <laughs> so I'm going to say hero. <laughs> say, uh, you know, spread your wings and fly, my dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really too much have an opinion on this, but, you know, if it did happen, you know, it, I think it happened for a reason. Um, you know, you know, a new beginnings could mean great things. So I'll be hero as well. All right, cool. Well, that does it for our last segment of the game, and that wraps up our podcast uh, pretty much. All right. Kevin, Peter, uh, thank you guys so much for inviting me on this. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, uh, make things too crazy, uh, and I loved being on here, so thank you so much. Oh, you were fantastic, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Ryan, I really appreciated your insight into the Metroid franchise. God knows that uh, Kevin and I both benefited from it. Um <laughs> The only thing that displeases me about you being on the show is that we did run long and I've got a lot of podcasts to edit, but the good news is that I have a long time to do it because <laughs> we're doing this early. The other good news is that uh, our listeners will have a lot of uh, a lot of our voices to hear, which is always a good thing. And <laughs> yeah. it was really fun having you on the podcast. I, I wish that you and I lived in a place where we could hang out more often. Of course, this applies to you, Kevin, as well. Um, Although, Ryan, I do know that you have connections to Denver, so maybe uh, something might be in the cards for us sometime, possibly. Next time I do a family vacation on Colorado, I'm going to make an effort uh, to come see you. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, definitely oh, hit me up. have my word. On the podcast, you have my word. <laughs> so there we go. There you go. It's in cyberspace. Uh, Kevin, of course, we're trying to get you out here to Denver sometime. I also am totally yes. down to <laughs> visiting the new digs and Tyler. Um, seeing what oh, your, yeah. uh, your kind of home it's a cool city place. is all about. So, uh, yeah. You know, the College Station days may be somewhat over, but uh, a new era is beginning, just like with Tony Hawk and Activision parting ways. It's the same thing, but better. <laughs> yeah, very There's much There's the reason so. why I randomly came over to visit Kevin. This place <laughs> is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> to run a 5K, which there's a funny story behind that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, d- I did want to kind of ask you guys about the, uh, the running y'all did this morning, but since we are so short on time i will just say that kevin and ryan are uh they're a little more athletic than me especially ryan i know that ryan is a, a running man and uh they did some hmm. 5ks and a, a 25k it sounds like is that what you did ryan did i hear that properly yeah it was uh, it was a 20 minute 5k this morning yep so a, not bad a 20 wait I'm a 20 minute fit. 5k yeah yeah okay i heard 25k as in 25 kilometers like whoa. oh no 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 no, no. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> although fun fact he was going to run a 15k at a 5k pace Oof, that was close. Not for, uh my girlfriend informing me that ryan was about to run the 15k and so then i, I was so determined ran over there to uh <laughs> to stop ryan <laughs> I asked him what would he do in that situation where after he had passed five kilometers well I assume he would have ran like six before realizing wait a minute did I run the 15k but um, <laughs> I asked him what he would do and he was just like I I don't know <laughs> <laughs> what, one last thing Peter you'll appreciate this uh, on my way up here to Tyler I was listening to y'all's uh, previous podcast and uh, there is this uh Highway 69, that's uh, near Tyler. So when I was listening to the podcast, the GPS interrupted it since I was playing through the, my car audio. It was like, turn right on uh, Highway 69. And when it cut back to y'all's podcast, you and Kevin both at the same time were like, sweet. <laughs> so it was, I just completely died wow. and I lost it. So I thought you'd appreciate that. Oh man, that's rich. That's rich. Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, so on that note, I think it's time for us to wrap up things here. I will give yeah. some shout outs to our own uh, social media. You can find us on our nifty website that Kevin is responsible for snagging. It is the interstate gamers dot review. We are powered mm-hmm. by Simplecast. We appreciate Simplecast and everything they do. We are now on Spotify, by yes. the way, kind of an awesome thing. Um, so if you're 
If you're not listening to us on Spotify and you would rather do that, you can totally do that now. Um, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is the IG underscore cast. Kevin's always on top of things. Uh, we have a Facebook page, which I think I mentioned already. Um, mm. If you want to look at the ratings that we've given our games, you can do so in a nifty spreadsheet I made. You can go to tinyurl.com slash IG ratings. You can find those there. Um, by the time this episode goes up, I'll definitely have updated it. Um, Ryan, do you have any social media that you want to shout out? <laughs> uh, I'm not very active on social media, so <laughs> I do have a Twitter, but i only on it to, uh, to follow certain people, and that's about it. So <laughs> I guess yeah. that's that's it for me. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, well, cool. There was, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Fuck, I can't remember what it was. Um, We're super accessible, if you didn't know. So <laughs> you can find us on any anything almost. I believe like the only thing we haven't put ourselves on right now is SoundCloud, which, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, I do remember the other thing I want to say. I was lucky enough to be a guest on an episode of the Yeasty Boys, which I might have mentioned earlier in the podcast. But uh, they will have aired that the week before this episode of Interstate Gamers comes out. So if you want to hear more of me, uh, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't, Feel free to tune into that <laughs> podcast, uh, Kevin. There, there was there was mumblings of uh, your boy Kevin being featured on that podcast someday. So, Kevin, if that's something you're interested uh, in, maybe uh, you can ooh. hit up Aaron about that. Uh, we can <laughs> expand the dynasty even further. Um, these two boys are also <laughs> right. a great podcast in general. I I wanted to be on that show because I like it so much. Uh, if you want to hear some good friends uh, shoot the shit, talk about beer, talk about other things, feel free to tune into that. Also, listen to For Pod's Sake. A, another group of Texans actually who do that podcast. They're very uh, entertaining guys. Very knowledgeable about the things that they do and the things that they like. So uh, if you want to hear a little more, a little more serious commentary from them as well compared to uh, the EC Boys, for example. So depending on what mood you're in, might influence what you <laughs> want to listen to. Um, right. But I just wanted to give shout outs to our fellow podcasters. We're all in this together, more or less. Uh, we're all doing different things, but we're all uh, having fun. And right. uh, that's all that I have to say. <laughs> cool. Let's wrap it up. Awesome. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And until next time. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you guys later. <laughs>